time is always a good place to yeah. start. So you went there, I think you said 1984, 1987? Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. I'm teaching there now. Yes. It seems to have evolved a lot. Well, um, I can tell you what it was like then. Um, I haven't been there so very re- recently. Peggy and I did a residency in 2017 in the summer. She both taught workshops and had a show there. That was when it was uh, still uh the um, University of New Haven had it was part of that for a brief into it yeah or yeah run yeah, through yeah. It, right? and that was before it whatever the most recent um, kind of went back to it was still a college uh, degree granting and I don't know exactly what its status is but it's a little different now yeah it's it's switched back to private and. Um, now go, going towards, I think, um, back towards accreditation, which is the okay. process we had to just go back through. I see, I see. Well, and the, when we were there, uh, as I said, we were in the first class in the new buildings that are just south of, um, of I-95. It had been the previous year when we visited the school. It was in the basement of the Lyme Art Association. And, and we were in that first class there, not as, there's not as many buildings as there are now, but there were just those first, first three studios. One of them is the art supply store. Um, by did the you, way, Peggy started the art supply store at really? Lyme Academy. Did, did, it was in a closet. The Garandes, is that how, how you say it? I think it was an artist that you had said that you... Yeah, um, uh, it's called the Garandes. I don't... That's just the name they put on it. Lassie de Garande was uh, Elizabeth Gordon Chandler's husband. He was also an s- a excellent sculptor, a uh, member of the National Sculpture Society. Um, his work had a little more of an art deco feel to it. Mm. Cool stuff. And uh, he never sold art supplies. He wasn't involved in that. So they just put his name on it for yeah. whatever reason. Um, but... Uh, yeah, um, so that was a studio, and then there were two other studios back with what was the de- where Dean Keller taught, uh, which was the figure studio, and that was the end of it. There was a little closet. We were there uh, that first year, and we were all, we as in Lyme Academy students, were all going over to Old Saybrook to buy art supplies. Mm. And so uh, um, we suggested that uh, we needed an art supply store just uh, and so uh, um, the director um, Nancy Heileman at the time said well Peggy would you like to start it and uh, and so we there was one full-time scholarship it was the uh, Wiggins scholarship mm-hmm. and they split it so I monitored all my classes, mm-hmm. and Peggy started and ran, started the little supply store there. It was essentially just a closet with a kind of Mr. Ed half door on the front, you know. <laughs> and uh, so the different teachers said what they wanted, and we got a budget to, you know, the school paid for the inventory. So, uh, so there was cans on paper and, and uh, Conte crayons and... Windsor and Newton paint and canvas, uh, some good canvas, because uh, um, because Aaron Schickler had started teaching there too. Wow. He was there for he taught there for two years. So Dean was the full uh, was teaching figure and teaching painting and teaching uh, you know head what he called head class portrait class and. Um, Brackman had been there, had taught back when it was over, mm. in the kind of his waning years, when it was over at in the basement of the uh, art association, and so then Dean um, was hired. He was had been teaching there when we got there, but uh, um, Mrs. De Garande wanted. Uh, um, I know some of this stuff because we were involved. They had student rec- representatives when things were talked about. So I was on some of these things. Wanted uh, another uh, painter of renown. Yeah. And somehow they made contact with Schickler. And uh, he agreed to do it. His 
class was set up on a, as the main teacher of figure painting and portrait painting. Um, he taught one class. It was set up on a very uh, unusual, kind of peculiar model, really. Um, we taught, we had one model for a month. Uh, it started out with morning and afternoon, six hours a day, three days a week mm. for a month, one pose. Wow. Um, and he, uh, I was his uh, monitor. So he would, would, he came out two days a month. He got the, he critiqued our work at the end of the pose and he was always so disappointed in it. Uh, he was just hilarious. He was a brutal <laughs> critiquer. And, um, and then he'd set up a new pose and we paint that afternoon and then one day with him working with us or him reading the New York Times while we painted. It's fine. <laughs> it was great. And, uh, and then take him back over to the train station at Old Saybrook and then we'd paint for, uh, paint for a month on these paintings. And then he'd come back at the end and say, well, these were going so well, and you just murdered them, you know. And then, uh, so that was the first year. The second year, they cut a day off of that. So it was, it was still uh, um, 24 hours a week for a month, so, uh, which gives you plenty of time to ruin a painting, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. And do you want to maybe elaborate on, um, you mentioned um, Dean Keller, mm -hmm. Aaron Schickler, um, Brackman. Yeah. Were there a, a few other instructors? Was Den Dennis Sheehan a part of it as well? No, he wasn't. Um, see, sculpture was uh, Elizabeth Gordon Chandler was the main teacher of sculpture. Her husband, Lotsey de Garande, uh taught. Um, they had one of their students, uh, um, Norman Lagasse was also teaching some, taking some classes. Um, the painting department was Jerry Karen, who no longer living, was teaching some outdoor painting. Dean was also taking, teaching still life. He was teaching outdoor painting. He was teaching figure. He was teaching head. He was teaching drawing. And uh, that for when we first came. Uh, then they he cut they cut back on uh, he cut back on some of what he was teaching and they brought Aaron in. Um, when we left in '87, we had a student show there. Peggy and I did a joint show. Um, the end of that summer, and uh, they brought on the next year. I think is when Dan Geno came in. Mm -hmm. They hired Dan. Um, uh, they had also hired, oh, I'm forgetting her name, she's a lovely lady, she taught still life painting, and she died a few, Diane Ashleman, mm. uh, and Lou Bonamart taught some watercolor, that was the entire faculty, wow. if I think I'm right, and then by the time we left, who did they have in? They were looking at bringing someone else in to sculpture, to, to sculpture, and, uh, I don't remember who they got. So this was a long time ago. Doesn't yeah. seem so. So That's a really great faculty, though. Uh, I mean, Keller yeah. for drawing and outdoor painting and still life. Yeah. Um, and I, I would imagine he would have last, left a lasting impression in uh, Schickler, uh, for sure. Yeah. Well, who, st who stands out for you in terms of, like, you know, maybe somebody who's made the most lasting impression? Well, I, Schickler with me, um, and now Dean was, I should have gotten more Dean. He had this uh, very constructive, um, he studied uh, uh, out with, um, at the John Heron Institute, studied with this uh, David Rubens, the, uh, studied with Dave Rubens, the anatomist, who wrote the book, um, which is excellent, and I uh, still still use. Um, so Dean was a font of knowledge, amazing demos just off the top of his head doing these, um, the anatomy of a leg or a shoulder and 
Uh, was, he, was he a student of, of uh, Hale or Bridgman? No, his, like... his father was a student of Bridgman. Okay, because it seems like the same kind of yeah. presentation on the big piece of paper with the chalk with the long... It thing. is, and, and of course his father had studied with Bridgman, then his father was at Yale from 1929, professor of drawing at Yale from 1929 until 72, wow. and was an uh, American uh, um, student of Rome, I forget what that's called. Where, Rome? Know, yeah, it? yeah, there's a, the America, the Rome Academy, whatever it's called. American Academy in Rome, yeah. right? Um, and so Dean studied with him, and then Dean went and studied with uh, Simi, is that the name? Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, he didn't really like that way of working. He, he was a more constructive person in, in terms of his approach. That was very much a very careful copying type thing. This is what he related to me. But he did study, and uh, because his father knew Anagoni, Mm. Um, and his father was, of course, over the, uh, was protecting, you know, a monuments man there in Florence. And, yeah. and um, so, what, and, and I got to meet his father, went to his memorial service and met his father a year or two before. I had this feeling of, uh, oh, it was a very nice connection. Yeah. And was, I was close to Dean, or I felt I was close. And uh, he was a lovely guy. Aaron, I'm more connected to the way he was painting. I, um, uh, it, he's a Degas yeah. kind of based work, that, that New York school that almost comes out of uh, Degas' work. And, of course, he studied with one of the Sawyers, um, mm. maybe Moses. Mm, okay. I'm, I, I'm not sure. There were three. Raphael, it wasn't Raphael. It was one of the Sawyers he studied with. So Max's dad actually, uh, I think, was in school with him because he was National Academy, right? I think. Who? Raphael Sawyer. I don't know. Yeah, it's just so fascinating to me the connection and how it's almost like just one or two steps the lineage yeah. to some of these painters. Oh yeah, yeah. That's really interesting, you know. I mean, of course, it's. Uh, there's no shared glory. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> it's yeah. not, you know, it'd be great. You know, I was a student of, but it's really what you do. <laughs> yeah. So you were there 84, 87. Is mm -hmm. that where you and Peggy met? No, we had, we had both gone and graduated with a certificate after three years at Ringling School of Art. We oh, met cool. there um, uh, late 70s. And painting program there? Yeah, yeah. Peggy was first in uh, commercial and then switched over because her dad was a painter and she thought, I don't want to starve. I'm going to go into commercial art. And then she said she was too much of a painter. So she came yeah. over and uh, and I didn't know what I was doing, but I was in I was in fine art because we had more time in front of the figure and more time to paint. And uh, uh, I didn't like have anything to do with a ruler, you know? Yeah less of an engineer right more more heart than head right? <laughs> i don't know i just just trying to draw you know i mean it started out in drawing in class and notebooks or in church or in on the floor with my brothers big brothers drawing is just something i always did yeah. and i was just trying to make it look like something that's awesome <laughs> so you went to ringling mm -hmm. got the certificate that's where you met peggy yeah, and we set up, we moved to uh, Decatur, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. I did uh, three years doing freelance illustration, mainly pen and ink. For uh, I did something every week for the Atlanta papers, and or more than that. And for, they had a Sunday magazine at that time, like uh, New York Times Sunday magazine. There's is one of the few remaining of these, yeah. but they had one. I did work every week for them, and then there were some other... A little bit of advertising, and there were some other magazines and things that I did. So we sort of made our rent and did that. You have the painting in the bathroom, and I was like, "Oh, it looks so some well, not similar, but inspired by Elaine Decker, oh. with with your hand. It's beautiful. And Thank I you. It felt like an illustration. That's my my background was illustration too. Right, right, right. You said so. I went to Mass Art in Boston. And uh, no art in my family except for my brother. And um, 
you know, if you want to do anything realistic, you had to go through the illustration department because the painting was right. all abstract. Right, right, right. But uh, a deep, deep love and respect. And, and that's what led to, I think, animation to mm -hmm. be able to commercially make it as an artist. But for me, it swung back in because they forced you to do heads and hands and be able to draw if you're going to do yeah. animation. And, uh, and then I ended up back in New York and yeah. started my training. Yeah, then you were caught in the current of it, and you couldn't get out. I just... I, <laughs> right? I mean, it's yeah. just so lovely. It, it was amazing, because it was like the things that I had searched for, um, they were just nowhere to be found in yeah. in art schools. Even in the 90s, I went 97 to 2001, and the connection to the French or the Impressionists, like it felt like art history skipped over what happened in the middle, and just went right to like the Impressionists and forgot about the French right before it. And that training is really, I think what was fascinating to me. So I used to go look at a Jerome at the MFA Boston. And it really like when I finally found the training, I was like, it all makes sense now of how to do it. Yeah, I think, you know, I was really trying, even when I was illustrating, uh, at Ringling, my frustration was was that it was just you could do what you wanted. I mean, the pa main painting class was just people sitting in there and doing whatever they wanted, and and a few of us were really into drawing and painting from life, and found out there was a little budget there that we could hire models, and and we did that. Um, but it wasn't systematic uh, enough to to really learn anything, and. Uh, and uh, along those lines, I mean, it was just very broad, right? So it, it wasn't narrow as it needed to be if you wanted to learn what I wanted to learn. So, uh, so then those years in, it, uh, in Atlanta between schools, um, and I was illustrating, and we were looking at painting, and uh, taking, there was something called Atlanta College of Art, the High Museum of Art then, and we were taking evening classes there, just figure classes. Um, uh, and I was, I was finally catching hold, I was looking at the painters that I really liked, like talked about Dinnerstein and, and mm -hmm. Silverman, and I noticed they were painting with these kind of shapes where they were, I could see the visual shapes that you were reducing things right. to, um, you know, kind of geographic and, and that you, and they had borders that you could, uh, you could align with level and plumb, yeah. and uh, and I was looking at some of this old stuff, uh, some old drawings, academic drawings that I saw that had those, um, that, that that had the curves reduced yeah. to the uh, straight to straight lines, and I figured out, oh, that's what you do. That's how you get. That's how you get things uh, uh, shored it up a little bit. You yeah. just kind of block visual blocking in to visual shapes. Figured that out. Like, well, I need to go to a school where I can. I need to. We need to get back into it where I can practice doing this enough to yeah. get it happening. Um, we also saw a show. There was a show, uh, and I, I said that this was. This is early '80s, right? It's probably '81, '82. And uh, and I call this neo academic work, and and I guess I'm neo academic. I'm I, you know, there's a center of it that's like really hardcore and anti modern and all this. I don't consider myself that. Never had those sympathies, but uh, but I really did want to pick up, um, you know, what makes Degas great, what makes Lautrec great, what makes yeah. Hodler great, what makes um, uh, Klimt and yeah. Sheila and all these painters that I love. Uh, um, you can't just do that drawing loopy out of your head. You have to have structure and understand it. It's very it comes from a very disciplined place. Well, and Klimt had, had a lot of that academic training in his earlier work too. Yeah, all you those guys. It. All those yeah. guys did. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. One of the I want to get back to your story, but. Um, when I was putting together the color book, I, I started to put together this map or lineage of who studied with who. Right. And I was trying to place 
how Jacob Collins, my teacher, fit in with Max Ginsburg, my other teacher. And Max had come up through, he taught with his, uh, studied with his dad, but he was through Hawthorne and Henshi back to the Impressionists. Right. And then Jacob was up through J, uh, Ted Seth Jacobs, uh, Michael Aviano, and up through, I think it was actually Brackman mm -hmm. side back to the French academics and you see that even Degas and Monet all had, was it, uh, I forget his name, Ramon, uh, the, te the teacher that was teaching them how to draw, that they weren't, you know, as academically right. trained as Jerome or um, Aang or anything like that. You but, mean the Impressionists? Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, but they were trained to see all that and yeah. then they broke out of it. You look at some of Rimoir's early figure work, Diana, and this beautiful portrait, La, La Bohème. It's a, uh, this girl with a striped skirt, and she has her hand, and black hair, and yeah. I, maybe she's supposed to be kind of a gypsy girl with the title. Sorry about the mower going down the street. But, oh, it's so good. And, um, and it's, very, it's very sound in, in terms of, as you would say, academically sound. You know? Yeah. But it's the breaking out of it. And we see the later work. And I always think like, you know, a lot of musicians are, I know you're a musician too, they're always so structured at the beginning. And then um, improv comes out of muscle memory and right. knowing so much about all that, which maybe, right. maybe we get you to play a little bit too. I know you do it on Facebook. I've got a trigger finger happening. I need surgery. I, I'm I'm out of. I can't even play a C chord without it. Okay. Without it. Can up. I'm very sorry to say. Nah, I, won't, I won't make you do it. Well, I can't. I would. I'd be happy to not do it, but um, but I can't not do it. Yeah. That's a joke. Sorry. I, I'm with you. I guess I'm saying uh, about the uh, this sort of neo academic impulse of my generation, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it was just wanting to be able to do all this stuff we couldn't do. There was also a little bit of, uh, I don't remember, even at Ringling, uh, I came with a very, very free attitude toward toward work, very open, because I loved, uh, you know, in high school, I just sort of loved it all, right? You know, I loved looking at Andrew Wyeth's yeah. drawings and, and reading about um, Duchamp and... It loved Miro, you know, the Spanish, and, and, and yeah. all this stuff. It just it was wide open. It was all fun and interesting, and and I uh, I never really lost that. I'm less crazy about Duchamp, perhaps, but um, th th there was a uh, you know, but there was this attitude of well, you don't, we don't do that now. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. Like it's like why, you know. Well, but even like the love, the honest love when you walk in a museum and then it speaks to you and then you learn what you should like yeah, and what you shouldn't like and that this destroyed that or something. And I'm like, okay, but I still like it. It just seemed like, I mean, the way I took it, you know, I was a young person, right? I took it just a bunch of old guys who were defensive. Yeah. And I really wasn't, didn't want to hear it. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I mean, I didn't go in this to have some some old old guy tell me that I shouldn't do that when he's yeah. all defensive about his own career. Yeah. You know, I just, uh, just not interested in that. It was just, Bitter. you know, it was BS. Yeah, bitterness to it all. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I just determined one, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna be looking over my shoulder. I was gonna do what I liked and what was interesting to me, what engaged me, I wasn't going to be looking over my shoulder at what people yeah. thought about it, whether this person approved of it or disapproved of it. You, all, you always have a lot of people who want to know if it's okay to like this or not, and they'd be all right with you if enough people, you know, I don't care about any of that. I just want to do what's interesting, and that's what I've done. And follow your heart, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's how you make art. All right, so why don't we uh, why don't we talk a little bit about Ringling? Yeah, um, you know to tie that back in. So you had gone there, you did your your undergrad, more illustration. Uh, anything you want to add to to the story? Oh, it was a real eye opener. You know, when I first went to Ringling, I just came, just a suburban kid, didn't know anything about it. My brother had gone there ahead of me. 
that's really why I went. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I love to draw. Um, I also love to play music. I was trying to play jazz guitar, and and I realized that uh, I hated nightclubs. I was a morning person. It just wasn't. I didn't want to be a. I didn't want to pursue that. Not, you know, and so I went into art and uh, went down there. Um, uh, loved my time there. I met Peggy. Her father was a painter. Um, uh, her family was from that part of the country. Went out. We went out painting. I mean, Peggy was uh, uh, going out painting landscapes, out of doors, on the spot before it was plain air. You know, it was yeah. just landscape painting back yeah. then. Yeah. Well, plain air seems to be a pretty modern term that's just it is, come that, back and coined. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, just outdoor painting. <laughs> it was, we just called it. We just didn't call it that then. But yeah. um, uh, but it was uh, outdoor painting, right? And uh, and I, when, by the time we went up to Lyme Academy, I was saying I took, uh, I had formed my idea of what painting kind of should be mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Peggy's father had friends who were painter. He was a painter. Peggy was doing this great stuff, and then plus things I was looking at at the museum. I said that I loved Degas and I liked some of this uh, um, New York uh, realist thing um, th that was happening. Um, so the idea that uh, painting should have a little swing to it and uh, uh, I went up there with that attitude. Peggy was already making marvelous painting. She was um, just a real natural. Um, I mean, you know, she would protest and say, "Well, she worked at it," which she surely did. But, uh, but she was always good. She just immediately, upon picking up a brush, could could paint, could make compositions. And uh, and I I always had I had this idea that if I could just learn to paint what I saw well enough somehow a painting would form on my canvas. It'd be composed and it'd be nice to look at. And, uh, and it's not true, but, but she's been a great teacher just uh, watching how she works over the years. I'm still inspired by it. I mean, she takes 40 by 60 canvases out on location, very naturally just composes it. I mean, because that's what she's looking for. She's yeah. not worried about whether she can paint something. Yeah. I mean that's always a part of it. I mean she's worried about whether this works. Yeah. So that and her whole orientation is is this working? Is this working? Um so it's taken me a long time. That's awesome. So she had a big influence in addition to your teachers having a wife or a partner at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was painting with you to be able to share a studio and and learn from each other. Yeah, yeah, and, and and going out and painting, and just and looking at going to museums together and looking at painting uh, together. We both wanted to get more. Uh, it was really Peggy who, uh, w when we went back to school at Lyme Academy, this was all Peggy's doing. Um, I just didn't think it, I'm a much more kind of cautious person. Uh, and uh, and I didn't think it was I didn't see how it'd be feasible and so uh, this was all Peggy's doing and we sent off the, we were looking at um, this is around 1981 82 83 in there we were looking at the National uh, Academy and uh, said the New York Academy was just starting up mm. we looked there we went and looked at these places and and um, uh, just wherever that that you could go and just spend a lot of time in front of the model. I always figured I could figure it out if I just had enough time in front of the model, which is, isn't necessarily so. But we ended up at Lyme Academy. We went out there and uh, met Dean Keller, and um, and it seemed feasible. We had a dog, and uh, I mean, finding a place to live in New York City where my brother lived, and with a dog, and how to make money, and all this was, uh, I don't know, maybe it just seemed a hard thing to, uh, yeah. to, to, to do. And uh, Old Lyme was lovely and, and uh, oh, it was great. It worked out really well. So, um, 
I I went. I was interested in when Aaron came on the last two years of the three years that I studied there. Uh, I was very excited about that because um, because I went and looked at his work and, and we went to his uh, studio in, in uh, New York City. Um, beautiful old studio right across from the Natural History Museum, you know, yeah. this fabulous win north light window. And, oh, just what a place. And uh, and he had these beautiful. I was very much into Holbein. That was uh, that was mm -hmm. my hero, you know. Well, the Frick and, then, right? Frick oh yeah, yeah, Holbein's. yeah. And and just and his work had that uh, that kind of focus in on things that that a you know, linear quality to it, a very fine linear observed edge of the face. Uh, kind of thing happening it really appealed to me um, and of course it was the Degas influence so I was excited about him coming on and and uh, he was uh, so th that was important um, he he was more in line just with what you know what I felt about painting and and uh, he was pretty hard teacher and and that he would give hard critiques and uh um, you know, kind of no. As I said, he, I was uh, told you a minute ago when we were speaking. He was uh, not very analytical person as far yeah. as painting goes, but he'd really tell you that isn't working, or, or, uh, or that's garbage, you know, or or this, you know, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Light on the dark side, dark on the light side in the background. That was corny when Rembrandt did it. Paint it flat. Paint it flat. You know, he had yeah. a very strong point of view about painting, yeah. uh, which you know I listened to. And then I just tried to figure out what he was doing. Well, because um, he wasn't very explicit about it, I don't think he really could be. Uh, but he, but he got us started with. Um, good canvas, you know, and, and painting light shapes, uh, starting by not painting, not color matching, yeah, but painting form. Um, he hated highlights. He hated, he hated uh, using a lot of accents or brush strokes. He called that rhetoric. Mm. You know, and you don't want to construct your painting out of rhetoric. It looks commercial. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so this idea of building, building solid forms. Um, he would start with. Uh, uh, back when you could get real, real life for not too much money, Windsor and Newton, Naples yellow made with lead. And uh, Kremnitz white were made with lead, and these things were silky, and it wasn't too expensive. Mm. And um, and green earth, and painting these kind of faint, ghostly shapes. And it's just you see it in Degas too. You look at De the way yeah. his starts, and and just just building up the forms out of a mid value dry ground, building just ghostly, building, composing by by these shapes across the yeah. canvas, and. And, and just having the forms come out. So you're both working up and down. Um, almost like tone paper. Yeah, yeah, almost like a drawing on tone paper where you use white, yeah. but you're doing it on canvas. And that was his approach. You can expand that, but uh, that... Um, was it wet into wet? No, no, it's pretty much... Well, you're starting with a dry ground, like a, a mid-tone dry ground. Yeah. Um, gray or green and or... Uh, Maybe a toothy canvas, not toothy like some of these I use, but fairly fairly toothy. I love the toothier canvas. But and I and yeah, and and, uh, uh, and then just just you're just bringing the forms out, right? You're bringing bringing the and you're connecting the Pushing lights them together. Back or pulling yeah, them out. yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so the modeling is uh, it. So it, so it's not. I remember I did a painting. I went home uh, uh, on a Christmas vacation or summer, and I did this little painting of my father. And um, Aaron critiqued that, that along with another painting, I did, a portrait I was doing. And he said, oh, no, 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 that's value painting. 
yeah. a real put down, right? Interesting. And so, so that that idea of constructing a painting out of um, that's that's value, you know, that's value eight, that's value seven, that's oh. value uh, putting it together like that, where you're yeah. pre-constructing and putting the stuff, you know, that's so, yeah, not so, that way so at all. Matching the value to the yeah, color. that was not his way. And it seems like a, a very Riley thing, right? Frank Riley. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know, but yeah. to him, that was uh, that was almost as bad as putting highlights on everything. <laughs> Garbage. I don't know. <laughs> And he was funny because because he would uh, he had a this is a sort of delightful contrarian spirit. So if you tried to get on his good side, like butter him up, like like what he liked, he'd take the opposite side against you. I love it. Or if he would say something about yeah, well look at what Sergeant did that, and so you want to go yeah, I like yeah, I like Sergeant. Oh, you don't want to look at Sergeant. Yeah. You know, sorry, I'm trying to fake the accent, but very, very contrarian. And, well, it's, and while it's being gracious, he was a yeah. real loving guy. But, uh, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, so, keep, so keep, I don't keep know. Keep you on your toes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's Lime Academy. Uh, um, and, and then... I'd say that still influenced me most in the way I paint. I kind of keep coming back to you can explode that idea out um, and kind of take principles out of it. I've also tried the more constructive or drawing uh, paint or underpainting. Um, I really looked at the you know Harold Speed books way back then and the yeah. uh, Solomon J. Solomon book. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Truck. Parkhurst, did you do that one too? The Painter in Oil? No, I didn't have that. The, did you do any of the Loomis ones? I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't, that 40s look to Loomis's yeah. drawing, I couldn't really get past that. Yeah. And, and and I'm sure they're good, now I want to kind of look at them after all these years if I get, Yeah. maybe I was too close to it. There was a, uh, I didn't like the realist work. I mean, I grew up in 50, I was born in 58, grew up in the 60s and 70s. There was still a lot of this art instruction that had this kind of real 40s look to it. That yeah. was, uh, um, I forget the name of the... Uh, Dean Cornwall? Well, that was cool, but but kind of art instruction books, they used to sell them in the art supply stores yeah. and this is how you do it the famous and, artist course yeah not that but i'm I, if i could think faucet oh faucet not not robert fall it was something i can't remember sorry um a kind of how-to look yeah that was very dated yeah. in in terms of the stylizations yeah. very 40s that mm, <clears throat> you know so Loomis yeah. kind of has that look to me that I had yeah. a prejudice against. You know, I wanted things that were yeah. drier, more... Uh, Jack Ham, too, I think. More the life Jack Hamm book. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're right. Yeah. They're more life, kind of seemed to me more lifelike and didn't have those stylizations that looked yeah. old-fashioned. Absolutely. Um, so. Yeah, so, so that kind of brings you out of Lyme. What yeah. did you do after? Like, how did you start to piece it together? Because... I mean, that is the hardest thing. How do you take your education? Oh, man, 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 man. I don't um, know if that's too long of a story, but but you had Peggy as well. To yeah, kind of... yeah. Peggy was selling. She was, I was saying she had several really good shows at Cooley Gallery in um, Connecticut. We decided to move down here, um, which was, not uh, she just wanted to paint the mountain south. I was thinking, well, you know, I'm doing portraits, but I should probably be near population centers because it... Portraits involve people, yeah. um, but we moved to the landscapes one out because she was selling, and uh, I was also was trying to thought I was going to be the be writing the great American children's book or something, and uh, and I shopped some of my books around for a while. Uh, long story, um, uh, I won't go into, but but some point during this process, I thought, well, I'm not painting. I want to get back painting, um, or I'm not painting enough. I never stopped. 
So uh, uh, started doing word of mouth portraits. Peggy picked up, uh, had a few galleries, uh, had a, one in Memphis that was really selling her work, still selling some through Jeff in Connecticut. I'm talking about the 1990s. Then uh, later in the 90s, got on with the Blue Spiral in Asheville and was selling okay, uh, you know, pretty much selling what she could paint. Yeah. Um, we had chill, you know, had a family. Uh, I started teaching. Um, so just just trying to piece together a living, right? You, try, yeah. you know, you bought a house somehow. Two, um, two artists came together with two art careers and... Yeah, and bought a house. Bought a house, and uh, things were pretty cheap down here at the time. They've really gone up, but um, you know, I was paying two hundred a month for a studio, and uh, our mortgage wasn't too bad. And I was doing some portraits. I'd travel a little bit, mainly word of mouth. Um, uh, um, teaching some, Peggy selling some paintings. Just however we. Just piecing it together. It was sometimes pretty rough, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, no money comes in for months. Yeah. You Selling know. paintings is the hardest thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've been doing it longer than I have, but I teach because it's, well, because I love to teach, but also it's steady. Yeah. And I know what's coming in there. And then the variable for me that's unknown is if a painting will sell. Right. But it's always a great call from a gallery to say that it it did or you have a commission and you're like, okay, you know, we, we can eat. But I also have a wife who has a full-time job, which helps. But so that kind of brings us to like where you are today. Mm -hmm. And you're running, uh, you have a little studio here. It's mm -hmm. not really little. Um, of course, in New York, this would be uh, humongous. But you have this beautiful studio here in uh, Jonesville. Jonesboro. Jonesboro. I always get it wrong. In Jonesboro, and you're teaching uh, just classes in the mornings. Yeah, three mornings. Yeah. So why don't, why don't you? Why don't you? I'm bastardizing it. <laughs> right. I teach. Um, uh, uh, I have a now a head and hands class, and have a just a head class, portrait class. I mean, they're both portrait classes. And then a still life, which is not just for beginners, but it does accept beginners. Mm. Um, and so uh, we can get people up and running with um, uh, mixing paint and what are materials you use and, and some different ways of gathering information to make paintings, whether it's uh, visual shapes or perspective and... Um, organizing via light and shadow and we do slideshows and look at the vocabulary from you know from painters um, uh, and paint live model paintings I'd like to get another figure class going but we'll see I only have so much energy and still have a lot of family stuff going that uh, limits it but does, does Peggy come in and teach too she she'll teach some workshops um, outdoor workshops for uh, uh, landscape. She was teaching three a year, a summer uh, uh, painting in town, in this beautiful old town uh, workshop, then painting water or painting in the mountains, and then a fall painting one. Yeah. Uh, we've, we're going to teach a joint workshop uh, coming up in uh, May called Life, Light, and Am Atmosphere. Peggy will take uh, pay students out in the morning five days they're painting landscapes they come in the afternoon after a couple hours of chilling i do a afternoon class where we're doing some still life and then with a little figure where we're just exploring using light uh the flow of light through paintings and organizing uh, not just by object but by light right it's amazing so yeah so two perspectives on, well, on we're painting. trying to kind of tie them in. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> but yes, two perspectives. Yeah. That's <laughs> Invariably. Crazy. Yeah. Amazing. So, so how did you, uh, why don't we talk about some of your, your commissions and portraits right. that you were doing? Yeah. I, um, I've always painted from, uh, from life, from sittings. I ended up doing mainly children, not exclusively. Uh, 
you know, it was a big change to go from uh, from Lyme Academy, where I'd have endless hours in front of the model, mm. uh, to, to to painting. Uh, you, you soon learn that just doesn't work. Um, with children, you have two to three sessions maximum. Mm. They're, they're, they're usually give you, and, and they'll give you a, the first one, they usually kind of give you that because they don't know what to expect. Second one, they're restless. The third one, they're very restless and tired of it. The fourth one, you're a sworn enemy. They hate you. <laughs> and so uh, you just simply have to get work done. And um, so I had to re relearn to paint. Uh, I mean, yeah, relearn. Right. I hadn't learned. I didn't know anything. I, uh, I could make some paintings that looked all right, but just labor and going at it and going at it, but I had to learn to get things quick. I never really liked the kind of bravura looking painting with uh, um, swishy and highlights and stuff. I just never, just never uh, was the sort of thing I liked. Um, yeah. I, I didn't like. I never liked things that look like they're in the style of. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted things to be my own work, right? Figure out my own way to do it. Yeah. So uh, my friend, the fantastic painter Chuck Bowdish, who just died a year or so ago. Um, uh, Chuck, I saw a show of his work in Atlanta. He was in, lived in New York. I saw a show of a uh, mm, good many years ago, uh, maybe 30 years ago. I don't know. He was using a very heavy canvas. Yeah. Very heavy linen and almost naughty, and and I just loved it. Really, and I realized that I could use that to, uh, you could get soft edges. I could get the kind of modeling that I wanted to quickly. Of course, I learned to use uh, line um, in my work. It it's not line is mainly on top. It's not underneath, right? So so I just use it. Um, it's, these aren't contour lines necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just using it now and then to stand for certain things. So if, uh, say, on the light side of a figure, you can draw the edge of the background as a line. Mm -hmm. It looks like a line. It's really just the edge of the background. Yeah. But if you're doing that, you can't cut into the figure because it's the background, right? Yeah. And so if you use that... Um, on the light side and selected things it can it can act as space it goes behind mm. right and then of course on the dark if the figure on the shadow side of the figure uh, that would be the contour line right because you'd be against a, and so you could so if you're very careful about what your line is doing mm. Is it grouping? Is, is your line massing? Is it separating foreground figure from ground? Line can do all this work, right? And um, I learned to do that, just uh, kind of figured it out. And also reading what some old uh, illustrators said, like uh, Sullivan, who was the illustrator that Rackham, pen and ink illustrator that Rackham kind of got his thing. Yeah. He did the you know, the Grateful Dead uh, skull with the flowers oh, around it. That's an old Sullivan, right? He was a oh, British. He anyway. wrote a book that was in the Lyme Academy yeah. library way back when. Wow. I think it was given to them by the cartoonist John Dirks, who did Old Story. Yeah. He, he was, his father invented the Katzenjimer kids. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, wow. it's a... Uh, uh, cool stuff, but he gave these great books to the library, and yeah. that that I got that idea yeah. from that. Um, but just but learning to just uh, using posterizing effects to create um, not a stylistic look so much, uh, just an abbreviated way of working so that I could work from life. Yeah. And I could get what I wanted. And some of this, I was just out on my own trying to figure out how to do it and how to do it quickly and to make something that looked good on the on a wall. Um, uh, wasn't these little monkey-sized portraits. It was a full-size head, you know, yeah. just under life. And um, 
from children. For also, we, I learned to use a, uh, to, um, I would take, uh, I haven't done this in a while, take um, uh, DVDs and before that, uh, VH, VHS, a little TV, mm -hmm. get the child placed where their eyes were looking where I wanted it yeah. and the light where I wanted it, then rig it up where the TV was up up there and watch a few the session would last uh, a Walt Disney cartoon with the yep. ads on the front and then the 90 minute if you're lucky some of them are 60 minutes and then you were done but it had a narrative arc so they wanted to be there during that it couldn't be anything they had already seen yeah it had to be something that uh, it was inviting and uh, and they wanted to see what happened, and so uh, and so that's that's kind of how I would do it. Now, and harder ones if I wanted them looking at me, get a reader, a book on tape, this yeah. kind of thing. That's harder. I've done some outside too, in outside light, yeah. uh, on, with books on tape. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's tough. You got you just it's a tightrope, you know, and uh, and that. That uh, you're sitting with the family and the, and you had a hard day and they're like, well, you're having dinner with them, you know, you stand with them. How, how, well, how do you feel it's going? Great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and it has to go great, you know. You, but it really needs to work. Uh, the best ones work immediately. Yeah. But sometimes you got to learn to. Sometimes you're having a struggle, and learning to not have the downer voices that say, you know, you're having a bad day. You're not going to get this. This is terrible. You know, getting that shut off yeah. and, and learn just to reconcentrate. See, see the shape, see what you're doing. Just, just calm it down. Look, 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 and don't listen to that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, learning to that, that's, that's yeah. hard work on the spot, but you know, really interesting work. Have you, have you had to work from photography at all? I've done almost, I've done a few posthumous portraits. I've done a few of these. I hate it. I can't paint that way. Yeah. I don't, there's not the information I need from photographs. Yeah. And it's flat and, and it's like a bonanza, you know. Oh, it's sitting still for me. Well, you can't get away from it. Your painting looks like the photograph. Yeah. And, and so, well, add something to it. Add what to it? Yeah. There's nothing to gather. You can't go deeper into it. No, I really don't like it. And there's always some, and it's just not what you want, and and it's not what I see. If I if if someone's sitting there and I look at them, I can take a photograph from exactly where I'm looking, and it doesn't look like what I see, yeah. and it doesn't look like it doesn't look like my painting. Well, if you do that, you say, well, I'll just I'll paint from life, but I'll just just to be on the safe side, kind of an insurance policy. I'll take some photographs. Well, those are sitting over your shoulder. They become, they become um, uh, the outside fixed reference that is the comments on your work. Yeah. yeah. And you think, oh, I didn't get this right. Oh, I didn't get this right. And, and it didn't, the photograph isn't even what you're trying to get. It's yeah. not what you saw. It's not the life you're trying to see. No, I, not only will I not use it, I will not take photographs when I paint a model for that reason. I don't want to be sneaking peeks at it. I don't want yeah. it sitting there critiquing my work and it's not even something I want. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> I love the, uh, you know, your work has a, a beautiful language to it. Thank you. I, I absolutely love it. So Appreciate it. Awesome. So... So you had mentioned um, Degas earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, and your love for Degas, and Funny. I know Jerry, our mutual friend Jerry Weiss, um, has an admiration for him as well. I love him. Can you talk about uh, Degas? What do you what do you see in his work? Because you were talking about line, you were talking about that kind of ghostly working out of the midtone thing. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, it's, it's such beautiful work. I, I think we had several art books on Impressionism when I was growing up, and I was very drawn to his work. 
Um, and then when I started drawing the figure, it, it just spoke to me. Um, uh, what's interesting to me about his work is that he brings a different kind of, it's a more, it's a Northern European Renaissance type composition. Mm -hmm. He really looked at Holbein, you can see, and he copied from Holbein. Mm -hmm. um, and where you have, uh, if you look at um, Holbein's compositions with, uh, uh, instead of this Baroque kind of swirling um, compositions or uh, or even Raphael, where you have more space, uh, you have a tighter crop. Mm. You have um, the there tends to be a kind of with with chairs and objects. There is a kind of perpendicular composition uh, that you see in Holbein. Mm. Definitely see it in Degas. He's yeah. looking at uh, front lighting, yeah. right? Instead of uh, instead of heavy chiaroscuro lighting, it's mainly most often, not exclusively, front lighting. You can see that in his language. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I observed, um, uh, I made this uh, discovery, um, to, which I hadn't read anywhere else, but you can see it. Um, there's a work, early painting of Degas at the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, place in Elizabeth Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Yeah. And it's this beautiful portrait. I'm going to slaughter Gojolin, Madame Gojolin. I don't know. I'm going to slaughter the name. Don't, don't judge. It's all good. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's fabulous. Look it up. It's just, it's just gorgeous. And, and I was, I loved it when I saw it there in person a few times when we uh, lived in Connecticut and we sometimes go up to Boston. I was, uh, I had it open one day in the studio, I was painting, and I thought, Holbein's Nicholas Kratzert. That mm -hmm. reminds me of Holbein's Nicholas Kratzert. I wonder if that painting, which I don't, I had a Holbein book, I don't know where that painting is. I wonder if that painting's in the Louvre. I opened it, it's in the Louvre. Mm -hmm. and, and so I realized that. So if you look at Nicholas Kratzert, uh, by Holbein, next to this painting uh, that I mentioned of Degas, you see it. Uh, the, he's just like, he's just using the language of that painting for this painting. Yeah, I and, love that. And then you also look at his pa his painting, The Collector of Prints, that's I at the that. Met. I love that. Same language coming off of coming yeah. off of uh, the uh, Nicholas Kratzer painting by Holbein. I know which one you're talking about then because it's the same two paintings I always look at. Yeah. And I think it's a woman with like a yellow chair that she's sitting in. She's in a red, she's wearing black. The yeah. wall is gold yellow behind Yeah, and she's a black hat, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Those two together I've always loved. Okay, put look at those two paintings together, yeah. then look at Nicholas Kratzer together and that's the that's the piece that You'll see. It's funny that you say Holbein, because right when you said that, my mind was like, of course. Yeah. Because there was a painting, they just had the Manet Degas show at the Met, and the way he composed it felt familiar. Right. And and then, again, when you just said it, I was like, oh, Holbein. Then you start looking, then look at Mary Cassatt's work when she started hanging with Degas. Mm. And she's using this same, um, this same tight crop, um, uh, this perpendicular architecture of a chair back, yeah. uh, flat lighting from front. She's doing the same thing, same Holbein language. Interesting. And, and, and there's this famous painting that she did, and some of these stories you don't know whether to believe, but suppose it was found, it was a painting that was found in Degas studio. It was attributed to him. Then it was learned, it was Mary, realized it was by Mary Cassatt. And, and she supposedly, he, she heard him say that women can't paint with style, don't have style or something. So she painted, I don't, I, I kind of don't believe that. But anyway, yeah. but when he saw, saw the painting, he said, what style or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, but it's it's this uh, sort of a homely girl with um, who's doing her hair back and she's, uh, it's a famous painting. She's wearing white, she's in front of a washstand. Mm. And um, a fabulous painting. Yeah. Um, and it, you really see that language. Uh, and, and then Mary Cassatt, of course, is using a real forced 
her color uh, um, compositions are usually down to two or three colors. Very forced color in terms of green chair, green fan, yellow skin, or just you know, just very simple, yeah. interesting colors. So that, yeah. so after Degas, I was looking at her too, yeah. and try because I was trying to paint some more free kind of stuff. But how do I put together? Uh, portraits and 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 I really like that language, but and I loved Holbein. Yeah. So, so that those kind of kind of came together. Not all I was looking at, yeah. but I really liked that. Do you find were they accepting of like Degas at Lyme? Because I feel like in my training we didn't really talk about Degas at all. But I would go to the Met, and I would see these beautiful not not the dancers that which is what everybody thinks about. Yeah. But his painting painting. Oh yeah. We saw that, oh, there wasn't any, there wasn't a, uh, to the degree that, um, I mean, there wasn't like a school pointing, we like these people or don't like these people, yeah, right? Yeah, but there's some, there sometimes is that now. Well, I'm sorry, there shouldn't be that. <laughs> but, um, I mean, Aaron, I, mean, I even... This is a whole complicated thing. I've thought about Degas. Of course, this um, Aaron Schickler and this and and Dinnerstein and these these painters, this Davis Gallery group, that comes off with a lot of Degas language, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of a lot of it's not just there, just from Degas, but um, uh, I, I won't go too much there. I had some of it. I didn't like and people who were f kind of doing Degas language that I thought there was too much casualness in the uh, in the gestures that was derived from f photography. Sometimes you needed a little bit more pulling that language in mm -hmm. off. It just kind of looked photographic and uh, and I said this. I remember I was said this to Aaron Schickler. Um, uh, he had. Peggy and I went out to his house on Long Island um, to take portfolios from the next year's class so he could review them uh, for students, prospective students, to get into his class. And, uh, and I said something like this. And, and Aaron said, excuse me a moment, and we were having dinner out on his patio, and he comes back uh, a few months later wearing a Degas t-shirt. <laughs> I, I, I didn't diss Degas, right? But... Yeah. So, they, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, I certainly didn't feel that was, uh, yeah. I mean, I was doing my own thing. No one else was interested in, in Holbein the way I was. Peggy yeah. was uh, interested in uh, painters. You know, at that time, she was looking at Levitan and that. Uh, who brought that out to Lyme Academy was um, t when Tim Lawson, T. Allen Lawson, yeah. came out to study Isaac with his, uh, yeah, with his friend Toby Burr, who's a fantastic painter uh, from Montana yeah. um, or Wyoming. Or they came out. Tim was in Wyoming at the time to study there, and they brought in all this. Uh, uh, Russian know, I hadn't painters. heard of yeah, it was Russian painters and. Just Serov yeah. and Levitan, and just Levitan was this fabulous painter. Yeah. Really an underappreciated, not by painters, yeah. but it, I'd never heard of him. We, and we, we ordered this, uh, you know, there was a published Blue Raven publishers out west, or was, were, were this, the Soviet Union hadn't fallen yet, right? So they were importing these Soviet yeah. art books. Wow. And, uh, which we ordered through Tim, but that, so Peggy's was looking, she was really looking at uh, um, Willard Metcalf. She loved his painting, loved, and Willard, loved Willard. Ennis, yeah. um, was interested in the whole old Lyme school um, or colony, um, but mainly Metcalf of that uh, group. Um, and then, of course, seeing Levitan's work, yeah. really loved that, but... Metcalf uh, was from Lowell, Massachusetts. That's where I'm from. Right. I guess I yeah. remember that. And Whistler was, Whistler, was too, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Kerouac and a bunch of others. But, but yeah, I, I never knew it. And then, you know, these painters that I love, like a lot of the American Impressionists, we were talking about Benson and, and Tarbell, uh -huh. um, 
for the 10, the American Impressions 10, um, all Connecticut, in the Connecticut kind of belt, some all the way out to Ohio, but there's just so much history in the Northeast with a lot of the painters that I love. So to come back now and see them all and go to the Florence Griswold and see that house where Metcalf has a painting oh, on the yeah. wall. Yeah, and you know, living in Old Lyme at that time, there were still, I mean, um, uh, Gerald and Weir's yeah. two granddaughters were still living there, Anne and Lynn. Wow. And, um, and Anne was a big uh, supporter of the school. Her husband, uh, Greg Smith, was son of the painter, Old Lyme painter, Greg Smith. But they had this fabulous collection of Gerald and Weir's work in their two homes yeah. there. Um, these ones that you'd see, Lynn, who was blind, Lynn had the one of the Christmas tree, the little kid outside the Christmas tree, wow. and, and Anne had a fabulous collection. And uh, it was a very rich time. And, and uh, getting to see that work, and then we went out with Anne, took us out with uh, Nancy Hyleman, and the director, when they were first thinking about turning the Jay Alden Weir, they were first working on trying to get this turned into a national park. Wasn't yeah. done yet. Went out and met Sperry Andrews and wow. and uh, and then the other some of the other family yeah. that was related to that was Jay Alden Weir descendants. Um, very rich time. I, I live right there. I live oh, a mile yeah. from the Weir farm. Yeah. Yeah. And they have the like it's a national park now right and uh i just i go and paint i'm not a good landscape painter but i'm just so inspired because the studio is still there and set up but there's so much rich history of painting uh in that area to tap into and cooley was selling a lot of right you know the uh, american impressionists which are some of my favorites and weir was on to some interesting things he was uh he had a little avant-gardeism in his, uh, yeah, you know that you you think of the Red Bridge, but um, uh, which is very Japanese, and um, but he was doing some kind of rather odd things. Cool, I mean, but yeah. really um, had his own direction. He was doing his later work, yeah. And they had a portrait in their house. Had a portrait of him by. I mean, they're long gone. They're lovely, lovely people. Yeah. Had a portrait of him by Sargent. Yeah. And cause who he was friends with, of course. And, and Chase, too, right? Wasn't he his good friend with William R. Chase? I would guess. Yeah. I don't remember a Chase there. There was a Bastion Lepage drawing of him, too. Amazing. And, uh, you know, that's fabulous work. Wow. Access to all that, being able to see oh, and study. Yeah, and lovely people. You know, just Old Lyme was a special place. Yeah. It is a special place, but... Well, that's awesome. Uh, I appreciate you having me in your studio and, and you know, showing me around and great chat. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Thank you.